Testing, one, two. Welcome to Mike Talks, talks that strengthen the muscle of resilience. The secret to my success is you show up and you lay another brick. It doesn't matter what you're going through, there is always another brick sitting right in front of you waiting to be laid. The only question is, are you going to get up and lay it? That comes from Will Smith from his most recent autobiography, Will. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But by all means, keep moving. Martin Luther King Jr. Many years ago, I started swimming the Midmar Mile. And I would train with three friends of mine. And sometimes we would go to a pier on South Beach. We would jump off the pier and then we would swim across a couple of piers coming in at North Beach, just the other side of the pier. I was the weakest of the four swimmers, so invariably I would fall a little bit behind. On this particular day, the swim was grueling and I was tired. It was, uh, it was pretty much desperation. I wanted to finish. And as I approached the final pier, I thought I would take the most minuscule shortcut. Literally, instead of going around the pier, I thought I would swim in on the front side of the pier. And I got to the first pillar, and the beach literally was about 30, 35 meters in front of me, and I started swimming, and I probably swam for about a minute, and I remember looking up and seeing that I had made no progress. Uh, I was still at the same pillar. I began to become a little bit aware that people were watching me, so I put my head down, swam like crazy again, and eventually looked up, and I had made just a little bit of progress. About five minutes later, through sheer blood and guts commitment, I made it to the shore. My friend Oliver was there and he looked at me and he said, Mike, what were you doing? He said, if you had just gone around the pier like you were supposed to, uh, the rip would have pulled you in. But now you were swimming against the current. He said, no wonder you're so tired. Being stuck like I was, where you're swimming like crazy, you're doing stuff, you're busy, but you're making no progress is probably one of the most helpless, hopeless situations to be. I'm sure all of us have experienced it in some form or another. Sometimes it comes because we're stuck in a conversation or we're stuck in an emotion. Have you ever spoken to somebody whom you haven't spoken to for a while? And as the conversation's going on, you say to yourself, gosh, this is the same conversation this person was in the last time I was with them. The same emotions, the same anger, the same uh, complaint. Sometimes we get stuck in a toxic situation. It could be a toxic relationship or perhaps it's a toxic situation at work. I'm sure some of us have experienced that. Sometimes we get stuck in a season or a moment. You two have got that great song about being stuck in the moment and, and you don't know how to get out of it. I've sure been there. And then how about this one? Sometimes we get stuck in an identity, a title, or a belief. I love what James Clear says in his brilliant book, Atomic Habits. He says, um, when you grip an identity too tightly, it's difficult to grow beyond it. And then he gives this brilliant piece of advice where he says, keep your identity small. When one belief defines you to such an extent, you might find it very, very difficult to, to grow beyond it, to, to find capability, capacity to change when life becomes challenging. So sometimes we get stuck swimming like crazy, looking up and knowing that everybody's watching us because it's a belief or it could be a toxic situation, could be that season, could be that emotion. I want to rather be the other side of the pier where there's movement, where I look up and I'm at a different pillar. Now here's the thing. If one person is this side of the pier, uh, stuck, and another person is this side of the pier, and they look up and they see the beach getting nearer, they're gonna be more resilient than the other person. Resilience comes because we see that we're moving. Despair comes when you feel that you're stuck. But here's something quite interesting. Motion is a little bit more complex than we might realize. Motion is multifaceted. 
there's different components to motion. And what I want to do in the next 10, 12 minutes is just share with you four different facets that have helped me, that have given me a sense of a perception that I'm moving. Because when I see motion with a, with a tunnel vision, I might actually get a bit of despair as well. Now, in order for me to do this, I want to share four words with you. And uh, I want you, we're going to try and put a combination of these words together. Now, if you could imagine a Y-axis and an X-axis. And at the top here, so let's call that 12 o'clock, we're going to have the word effort. All right, effort, uh, where you have to apply lots of energy. We're going to drop down to 6 o'clock. And we're going to have the word ease. So ease is the opposite of effort. Let's go to nine o'clock and we're going to have the word here discomfort. And then we're going to cut across to three o'clock and we're going to have the word rhythm. Rhythm is a word which is potentially the opposite of discomfort because when we are in rhythm, everything is just sort of moving right. Now let's start between three o'clock and six o'clock. So hopefully you're with me and you can see this between three o'clock and six o'clock. What is the motion that we get when we are in a place of rhythm and ease? All right, rhythm and ease. There is a motion that comes when these two words connect. In 2012, uh, myself and a couple of our family members decided to climb George Peak and Craddock Peak. That might sound like a long distance apart, uh, but they're two peaks that are right next to each other in the Otaniqua mountain range. It's quite a steep climb and you climb for about three hours and the climb for us was hot. It was December and the clouds were not there. It was this blue sky. The sun was shining. And as we got to the top, we had these most incredible views. As you look over the Indian Ocean and the town of George is just below you. But then something really strange happened. Within a matter of minutes, we suddenly found ourselves in mist. Now, we're walking in these high elevations, steep cliffs close to us, and we can't see more than a meter in front of us. What do you do? What, what did we do? We sat down. We were in rhythm with the context. The context wasn't allowing us to walk, but we were invested. We were, we were in a place of ease. Um, we weren't going to just park here forever. We were waiting for the clouds to, to go away. Rhythm, ease. The most amazing thing happened, um, just as quickly as they came in, they left about 15 minutes ago, 15 minutes later. And it was, it was this amazing thing to see how disorientated we had got within that short burst of cloud. I'm so glad we sat down. In 1997, Steve Jobs became the CEO of, um, of Apple. And Apple was apparently in huge trouble. There are reports which say they were three months away from liquidation. A reporter, and I'm sure many others, asked Steve, um, how are you going to save Apple? And he had answers. He spoke about cost cutting, about uh, making the organization lean. But he also had a very interesting answer, and the answer went as follows. He said, I'm waiting for the next big thing. Apple was in mist. And Steve Jobs said something like this, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to be invested. I'm going to be aware of the context with the rhythm of what's going on around me. And guess what? We're going to be ready for the next big thing. The reporter asked him, said, Steve, what's the next big thing? He responded, I don't know, but we're going to be ready. And guess what? A year or so later, Apple was ready for that next big thing. And we know they haven't stopped since then. Steve Jobs became the observer, looking beneath the surface, finding the subtleties. Sometimes motion is found for us in actually being the observer, slowing down, noticing context. There's a thing called the trained incapacity of the expert. Quite a big term, the trained incapacity of the expert. What that means is that sometimes we can become so good at something that we forget to notice the context. And because we forget to notice the context, what we do is we pull from our memory banks prefabricated solutions to existing problems and we get it wrong. Sometimes we need to be encouraged to slow down, sit down, 
be in rhythm with what's going on around us, be at a place of ease so that we can actually move forward physically. But make, mo make no mistake, the act of sitting down as the observer is motion. Good, all right, so that's our first um, three o'clock to six o'clock. Let's move from six o'clock to nine o'clock. What we've got here is we've got ease and discomfort. In August 1963, this man is feverishly writing a speech at four o'clock in the morning, almost frantically. A couple of hours later, he's sitting on the back of a stage and he's still writing. As they invite him to the podium to a rapturous uh, applause, he walks and he's still making notes. And over the next 20 minutes or so, he delivers what is arguably the speech of the 20th century. Was Martin Luther King Jr. unprepared when he did the speech, I, am, I, I have a dream? This incredible speech, which has got lines that go something like this, that I have a dream that one day my children, my four children, will, will be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. That's just one line that blows one away. There's so many in this speech. Was he unprepared? Well, the answer is probably not. Martin Luther King Jr. had been a activist for 20 years. He had given sermon after sermon from the pulpit in a church. He had given speeches against uh, the wrong, the unfairness of uh, segregation and uh, racial, racialism and all these challenging things. Uh, he had learned poetry, he had learned scripture, he had made rhymes, he had narratives. And he had kept them open in this most incredible speech, which he does on the March on Washington. There's this thing called the Zygonic effect. And what the Zygonic effect says is that when we conclude something, we begin to lose levels of consciousness towards it. But when something remains open, and almost through trial and error, through improvisation, we pull things from, from what we know, uh, we have the probability of some, something really magical taking place. If Martin Luther King had concluded his speech um, three months before, he probably wouldn't be able to respond to the lady who shouts out at 11 minutes from behind him, one of his favorite gospel singers, Martin, tell them about the, the dream. And literally from that moment, he abandons his notes and he begins to just pull. Martin Luther King was in this incredible place of motion, but the motion had been made possible because of all the things that were in his memory, that he had brought to places of consciousness, that he could pull and just connect dots. Martin Luther King was the adventurer who was just letting things unfold. He was in a place of ease, but in a sense discomfort because this wasn't being concluded. He was prepared to play. Sometimes I'm in motion because, like Steve Jobs, I become the observer. Sometimes I am in motion because I keep the most important questions of my life open. And in many respects, I don't go in a linear line. I go backwards and forwards and everywhere. And yet there's this beautiful motion that is taking place. I become the explorer and I let it unfold. Let's go from nine o'clock to 12 o'clock. And remember our two words that we're dealing with here is at nine o'clock we've got discomfort and at 12 o'clock we've got the word effort. When I was nine years old, a friend asked me to run a 10 kilometer fun run and I ran the 10 kilometer fun run. And I fell in love with running. And in many ways, I became like Forrest. I never stopped. I just kept going. Now, when I was 9, 10, 11, school years, um, running was competitive for me. Uh, I did it because I enjoyed it, but I did it because I also wanted to try and do the best that I could do. And as a youngster, I learned this technique called fartlek. Now, fartlek is a Swedish term, and it goes something like this. Imagine I'm running down this long road and there's a whole lot of street poles. And I say to myself, for the next three street poles, 
I'm going to run at pretty much race pace. So in other words, it's quite fast. But when I get to the third street pole, I'm going to up the ante. I'm going to try and go another 20% faster. In other words, maybe just below sort of sprinting. And then I sprint, or I, I go at this pace for um, two or three street poles. And as I hit that second or third street pole, I then cut back again, but not to, to standing still or to a slow jog. I cut back to my race pace. Now my lungs are bursting and my heart is beating and I'm hanging on. But I know that this effort with discomfort is digging into the reserves of potential that I have within me. Sometimes motion takes place because we are determined to be people who discover the growth that is within us, the potential that can only be uncovered through discomfort and effort. Towards the end of last year, I got into the autobiography of Bruce Springsteen, uh, Born to Run, awesome autobiography. But there's this, um, this conversation that Bruce Springsteen has with himself um, when he and his young band, 21-year-olds, 22-year-olds, they go from the east coast of America, Jersey, to the west coast, LA, and they want to try and make it. They want to try and do something better. They want to be known in more than just one state. But they don't get the, the gigs that they want. And Springsteen knows why. He literally says these words. He says, I was fast. In other words, I was a good musician. But like the gunslingers of old knew, there is always somebody that's faster than you. And he carries on and he says, and if you can do it better than me, you earn my respect and admiration and you inspire me to work harder. In other words, he's saying, I, I need to go and do some fart leg. He carries on and he says, um, I had only one talent. I wasn't a natural genius. And I knew that I was going to have to use every ounce that was within me. My cunning, my showmanship, my musical skills, my intellect, my heart, my willingness to show up with more intensity than the next guy, just to be able to survive untended in the world in which I lived. He says, as I sat there, I knew that when we got home, there would have to be changes. What Springsteen was saying here was we were going to have to dig deep. This was going to become uncomfortable and there was going to have to be effort. So they go back to Jersey, they make big changes to style of music, to band members. They lose their ability in the short term to make money, to survive. But we all know the story in the long term. Springsteen becomes one of the rocking roll heroes um, of our time and the E Street Band gets formed. Motion is sometimes found in that place where we seek growth, where obstacles and challenges are not shunned, but rather engaged. So let's just stop for a moment. Motion is sometimes found in the place of being the observer, like Steve Jobs. Sometimes it's like Martin Luther King, uh, just unfolding but doing, creating the magic. And sometimes it's like a, a Springsteen where there's effort, discomfort, but the magic comes from there. And then finally, let's go from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, our final quarter. So <clears throat> let's stay with the running example. I love it when I'm fit. And I know that it's just a matter of time. I'm going to go for that run and everything is just going to click into place and conspire for me doing my best time ever. There's this magical moment when you've done all the hard work and you get out on the road or whatever the occupation is and everything just works. And your mind is saying to you, um, you're going too fast, but you're in this type of rhythm and you're applying effort. And you know that the worst thing you can do now is stop is slow it down and so what do you do you just go you unstoppable and these are the beautiful moments where we do our best times where we do our best work but they're always founded on the fact that you've done the hard reps now in order for us to move into this beautiful place which we're calling flow we've got to become endlessly fascinated with doing the same thing over and over again and sometimes I wake up in the morning and I might need to go and do a coaching session or a facilitation session or a talk like this one. 
And I say to myself, Mike, make this one the best one ever. It's going to be effort, but let's see if we can find that rhythm because we've done the hard work. Now, this doesn't guarantee that it is going to be the best one ever. But when you wake up and you play this game and you say, I'm endlessly fascinated with doing this thing over and over again. I'm going to put in the hours. I'm going to seek mastery. And I'm going to try and make this one the best one ever. We begin to find the most incredible motion that we don't think is possible. Think about it. Uh, it might be the best one ever in terms of a meeting you have. It might be the best ever presentation. It might be the best ever production run. It might be the best ever marketing campaign. It might be the best ever conversation that you're going to embark on. It always comes because you've done the hard work and it's done. It, it comes because you're hungry and you say to yourself, I'm okay to be fascinated with doing this over and over and over again. Motion is sometimes found in stillness. Motion is sometimes found in exploration. Motion is sometimes found on the road where your lungs are bursting and you're seeking growth. And sometimes motion is in this beautiful place of flow where you've done the work and you're seeking the best one ever. And that's what helps me get into motion. Sometimes I say to myself, Mike, be the observer. Sometimes I say to myself, this is about growth. Sometimes it's, uh, let's just keep that question open. And finally, well, let's uh, go and do the best one ever. There's always a brick. Sometimes the brick is in this quarter, and sometimes the brick is in this quarter. But there's always a brick. Sometimes we're sprinting, and sometimes we're crawling. But there's always a brick. May I encourage you to... Um, to use this language to find that place of beautiful motion which builds our muscle of resilience. Now you would have noticed we put a little chart on with this video and you will see that there's a little diamond in the middle where these four quarters surround it. Do you want to know what's in that little diamond? Well, that's the nuclear explosion that happens with motion. I know possibly not a great word to be using at the moment, but that's the nuclear explosion that makes all these quadrants possible. And guess what? Guys, that's Mike 4 coming to you soon.